Um, I think I just curtsied in front of you. You did. Um, I have never been in such like a bubble of li love before. This is kind of cool to parasitically live off your bubble of love for, for a moment. It's a love bubble. <laughs> love bubble. Um, okay, let's just get this out of the way. You are. You look beautiful. You were so nice backstage. You're such a nice person. Thank you. I'm not shocked. I'm just saying you're nice. <laughs> um, and okay, so I saw. I watched the film last night. It's so absorbing, and I think for me, it's mostly absorbing because I get to see how you write songs, or I get a window into your creative right. process. And I have so many questions about how you work. Um, but first of all, I wanted to ask, in, in the beginning of the film, you and um, Mr. Stewart, who's here tonight, um, who's also totally cool and amazing. <laughs> um, you mentioned how uh, you're doing this film uh, to sort of take, take it for the music industry, and you want to do it things the old way. And I wanted you to, to explain that, what you meant by the old way. Well, the old way, really, up until not that long ago, was the only way. Mm -hmm. And that's just being, um, you know, when you make a record, you make a concept record, you sequence your record so that even if somebody doesn't like the third song, they're probably going to listen to it anyway because it comes out of the second song and goes into the fourth song really beautifully. So they're not going to superstitiously go over there and take the third song out. It's like um, they give it, they, you know, the world used to give you more of a chance. You know, they might not like everything on your album, but they're going to like some of it, so they're going to listen to all of it, and then maybe they might fall in love with the whole thing. And that's what you hope. Um, it, you know, in the, what, the reason that, that Dave and I made this record the way that we did, we made it at my house, and, and we made it that way because in the old days, not even so old, I mean, Fleetwood Mac did the same thing in 2002 and three. If you don't own a big house to make a record in, you go and you rent one. Because uh, A, it's $2,300 a day to go into a really nice studio, which adds up. And uh, so, or you rent a house for, for $25,000 a month, you know, and divided by four or five or two or three, it's, it's better. And you don't have time limits, and nobody's, you know, yelling at you to turn down the noise because you find a house that's got a lot of room on both sides. And um, so you, 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 you instantly are more calm. And when I decided to offer up my house for this record, um, I had bought this house uh, in 2005, and I really, I have a dog, a little tiny Chinese, she's in the movie, you'll see her. She's she a is. star, she wanted to come for today. She makes out um, with the couch, that, so I mean with the carpet at one point. So yeah. cause she knows her life's going to change. Um, <laughs> she's 14, um, and she's, she's a Chinese crested Yorkie, and so she's more Chinese crested than Yorkie, so she has no fur. And um, so she wears uh, only Ralph Lauren cashmere, <laughs> and and very expensive cashmere from Italy, nice. especially made for her by, nice. by her auntie Sharon, who sings in my band. And um, anyway, so the fact is, is that when you you know when you make a record in your house, you are you are able to really be yourself, and you're in, you're because you're in your you're in your place, you know, and um, and. Dave would come about two every afternoon, and he, in the beginning, in the first three months, he'd go home about 8.30 because he has two little girls, and so he couldn't just be hanging out until five in the morning. Right. And uh, then, then me and my girls, Sharon and Lori, we would work with uh, my assistant Karen, and we'd work until, you know, one or two or three in the morning. And so that when he would come back the next day, we would have worked out a lot of our vocal port mm -hmm. parts mm -hmm. so that he didn't have to, that he and everybody else concerned didn't have to sit there and you know, listen to us work out harmony parts. Right. So that's always a great way to do things. So we're, we're like all ready with our parts, which also means that we like them, we don't want to change them. And right. if you have ideas, that's great, but, you, but we it, like our parts. You, sa <laughs> you say in the film, um, this is the first time you've written with someone else in the room. I hope I got that right. And yes, explain that, is. like you, you usually go away to another room or something and... No. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, let's go back to the beginning. Right. Let's go back to Lindsay Buckingham. Yeah. Um, even Buckingham Nicks. So when Lindsay and I started writing the 12 songs for Buckingham Nicks in, Los, in San Francisco, um, his dad rented us a, he didn't rent it, he gave us a room in his coffee plant, which was up by the Cow Palace in San Francisco. So whenever all the workers would go home at 6.30, Lindsay and I would go up there about 9, and we'd stay until 3 in the morning. 
And so we had this big creepy coffee plant to work in. And, and we would, you know, we would record there because we had an Ampex, uh, that was an Ampex tape recorder that was four track that's about the size of a washing machine. Mm -hmm. Not now, but then it was a big piece of equipment. And so I would pretty much write my songs at home wherever that was, whether it was at Lindsay's parents' house or whether it was at my apartment or whether it was my apartment down in San Jose when I was going to school. And then I would like leave that cassette by the coffee pot with a note that said, new song, you can produce it, but don't change it. And so that's kind of how it went. And that's really the very beginning. So I was never open to writing with Lindsay or anyone else because I felt that the writing of a song was very selfishly my own. And mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to go in the room, light the incense, I wanted to cry, I wanted to take my poetry. I didn't really want to share that with anyone. Mm -hmm. So, but when I met Dave, I mean, not when I met Dave, because I met Dave a long, long time ago, but when we started this record, he said, well, I hope we can write some songs together. And I'm saying like, yeah, I hope we can too. And in myself, I'm, in my head, I'm like, not, not a chance. <laughs> <clears throat> And so, but I'm going to go with it because I'm polite and I like you. <laughs> and um, so what I did was I gave him, I thought, I really am going to go with this. I'm going to give him a chance, which I really would never give Lindsay a chance because Lindsay and I just had way too much baggage. But I didn't have that kind of baggage with Dave Stewart, you know, so I didn't have all the reasons to hate him. <laughs> so... So I was open. I was like an open book with Dave, you know. So what I did was I gave him a book of poetry, which had about 40 poems in it. And I, I, I talk about it a little bit in the film. I did not in a million years expect him to read all those poems. Because if I had given that same book to Lindsay, he would have went, oh yeah, sure, really. I'm going to read all this. And, you know, it, it's like, you know, all the, airy, the fairies and the, and, the, the, and the lost love affairs that aren't about me. and. And I'm going to read all that. So I didn't really expect Dave to read this book, but he did. So when he came in, and we're sitting just like this yeah. in the living room, except we have like a fireplace. It's fantastic. And he says, um, like this. he goes, so I like this poem. And I'm like, what am I going to say? I gave him the book. So I'm going to say, like, I didn't really give you the book for any reason. I, I didn't give you the book because I was going to try to work with you. I, I just gave you the book so you'd have it on your coffee table. So I said, okay, and he said, so, and there's a microphone, because we, uh, we always have a microphone over our coffee table, and he says, um, just in case, and, and he says, um, he says, well, I like this poem, and I'm like, well, I, I like it too, I wrote it, and he says, so let's, let's, let's do this poem, and I'm in my head, I'm like, are you crazy? But I think, okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go with this. So he starts, you know, he starts playing. Da, 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 and he goes, and I'm just staring at him with a blank face, you know. And he, he goes, so I'm, I'm, I've got the poem in front of me too, and I'm like, okay. And I'm, uh, you know, so I'm like, uh, like, you may be the one, but you'll never be the one. Guess who that was about? <laughs> You may be my love, but you'll never be my love. Wonder who that one is about. <laughs> and so, five minutes, Dave Stewart and Stevie Nicks have a song that's really good. It's and it's, that's the first time you've done that. That's the that's first time. The first song we that wrote. But that's the first the time. The first time I have ever. That's crazy. Now I, I have written with Mike Campbell, but in a very different way. He sends me a CD in the mail. Mm -hmm. Or he sends it over with a, you know, in a car, and but he doesn't come with it. Right. So I, he, he'll send me 13 tracks, and it'll just say tracks for Stevie, and I'll sit and I'll listen to them by myself, and me and the girls, and and we'll we'll like, you know, maybe we'll write a song to some of them, and maybe we won't. And Mike is great, and he's been wonderful to me my whole life since I met him in 1979. He he does that. So I've used a lot of his tracks. Tom Petty does too. So, um, but this is very different. Yeah, and, it's, it's not like listening to a track and going, I don't really like that. Because you don't want to hurt, you don't want to hurt people's feelings. Right. You, want, you don't want to say, well, I think that sucks. And also, also, I don't like the way you're putting my words to, to that music that I think sucks. But so you're making my words suck, actually. 
There are some hilarious so moments where you're, where you're, where you, you tell it like it is. I mean, to Dave even, like mm -hmm. when you're like, I don't like that solo. That sounds too weird. Uh -huh. I want it to be. Um, so you definitely have a clear idea about what you wanted to do with this record. Yeah. Um, but also with Dave. He doesn't care. He's, Dave doesn't he plays around. care. Yeah. I can say to Dave, no. <laughs> and he'll just go like, all right, all on right. to the next part, you know. Yeah. So you never, he never puts you in that place where you feel like you've heard him mm -hmm. or you've been a, a total, you know, biatch, you know. <laughs> you, you haven't done that to him because right. he doesn't let it. He has daughters, so he's really good with women. You know, he right. understands that we're that we're sensitive and and that we don't we you know we don't we're we're sometimes we're going to go along with stuff that we don't really love because we just don't want to hurt your feelings. But he can read read you, and he he got it. I wouldn't even if I was if he was like you and and he started to play something that I didn't that I didn't love before I even said to him, he's he like know. changing the chords. <laughs> yeah. So we never even we would never get to that part where there would ever be a harsh word or an well, argument or. I love how he says in the film um, how you guys have such a rapport because you both were in love with somebody and then broke up and kept the band going. And got famous. Yeah. Duos. Uh, famous There's duos. There's not very many. Right. Right. There's Sonny and Cher. There's me and D me and Dave now. Mm -hmm. There's me and Lindsay, and there's Dave and Annie. Mm -hmm. And there was the really famous country duo that I can't think of their name now. You know, every once in a while, a really big duo will come along, but it's not all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, it is with Dave and Annie and with Stevie and Lindsay. Same thing happened. Went together, lived together for five years, broke up, formed a band that got hugely famous. Right. So it's, it, it's that's, the, that's the underlying thing that Dave and I had was that we both came from these strange and crazy duos mm -hmm. where you know you're you're in love you're living together and you're doing music together and you try not to get one get let one get in the way of the other and that's hard sometimes mm -hmm. because when you love somebody you don't really want to tell them that what they're doing is stupid <laughs> so you so you don't you right. know and so stuff happens and you end up recording stuff that that you hate but you again, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to hurt people's feelings. So, um, it, it it's it, it's trial and error in that. But coming from that, both of us had a very good um, idea of what we were doing because really what we were doing was we were sort of becoming a duo, mm -hmm. even though he doesn't you know sing on all the songs or anything. Right. But still, the working duo of Dave and Stevie became right. a duo. Oh, I, I definitely hear his influence in in, this, in the music uh, um, completely. Um, the song "Everybody Knows You." Uh, that was and that was the first thing he's. That see was more like what Mike Campbell does. He sent that to me, uh -huh. and I was uh, I had rented a house in Malibu. And I was looking through, I was going through cassettes. I have vaults of cassettes. So my, my, my sister-in-law, Lori, and I were going through all our cassettes. And Dave sends this song down. And so we put it on, on repeat, and just let it play over and over and over with the ocean, you know, crashing. And until it started to become, sound like a song on the radio. Mm -hmm. And with this particular song, Dave wrote, just like he did with every with Don't Come Around Here No More. Mm -hmm. He wrote, everybody loves you, you know, but you're the only one, mm -hmm. I'm the only one that knows you really, da, da, da. He wrote those four lines, and then, and that that's a little different than just having somebody send you an empty track, mm -hmm. because then he started the story. So you, you don't, he started it, so you then have to build a story around those four lines. Mm -hmm. So I started building a story around those four lines, and you know, I finished it in about one night, Mm -hmm. And um, and then I went back to my house where we recorded the record and and we uh, threw the the words on at the first verse, I, I, and we sent him we sent him back the first verse, mm -hmm. and he liked it, and I said okay now well if you if you like it and if you like where I'm going with this then I'm going to go do the second verse, mm -hmm. so I went and I did the second verse and then we sent that back and we the song was written basically, so that was the song we started with um, at Dave's studio high window. Um, so that's really how it all began. Mm. And You May Be the One was the, f the, was the f second song that we started when we moved into my house. Mm. I'm so cu curious about all these vaults of cassettes and books and poetry. I feel like you're secretly a really, really organized person and you have everything at your fingertips from like your past. Well, 
I have really great people too that help me. Right. I mean, my journals are very organized because it's like you know today, tomorrow, the next day, right. and you just put. I I, didn't, I never know what the date is, but I put Thursday, Friday, Saturday, <laughs> and then I I'm hoping that somebody will have written 2012 on it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But, but, um, the cassettes because I have an amazing assistant. Um, and, and my girl singers also um, have been with me since 1979. So between those three, they really keep all those cassettes very organized. So we have vaults in Phoenix, where because I lived there, I had a house there right. until a couple years ago when I sold it. So um, I, but I still have all my storage there in Phoenix with you know all, a lot of my great stuff and all the songs. Then we also have drawers of them here. I mean, not here, but in Los Angeles, mm. and they are all labeled. Hmm. And um, so we know where to go when we're looking, you know, like with Annabelle Lee, we, we found that in the demos. Oh, and, you, uh, you had already scored that to music at some I point? I had put it, I had made a demo in mm -hmm. probably 1996 uh -huh. of Annabelle Lee, uh -huh. but I wrote it when I was 17. Right. So, but I hadn't, I didn't make a demo until 1996. Um, and it was just, I mean, you did. Were you like, oh yeah, I remember doing that, or was mm -hmm. it? Oh, I was totally it? remember it. So you have this incredible, not only that you have this catalog in your brain of your entire yeah. Stuff. I don't. Annabelle Lee is one of the only songs that I actually never recorded, but totally stayed in my head. Oh, amazing. So I would, you know, every once in a while I'd go, many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea. So I never forgot it. Right. It was always there, and and when I decided to make the demo of it. Um, I, you know, I didn't know how it would, if it would come out good. It came out great. The demo came out great. Yeah. So um, then when I, uh, I laughing, I said this, uh, I did an iHeartRadio thing night before last, and I had to listen to it back because it's a, a radio thing. They gave us like 72 hours to go in and tweak it a little bit. And I'm listening to what I said, which is true, which is I said to Dave at one point, you know I wrote a song with Edgar Allan Poe <laughs> in the 1800s. And he's like, you did. And I'm like, I did. And I, and I said, it's, it's, really, it's a really good song. And he said, darling, can we find it? <laughs> and I said, it's in Phoenix in a vault. <laughs> and he said, can we, can we get it? I said, of course we can. We can get it. And that's what, what and then I sent Lori home to look for it. And, uh, and she found it. And, because it's, it's, they're all labeled, you know, so right. she found it, and then, and, and, and he loved it, you know, and, um, and, you know, it was recorded within a couple of days, you know, so it's like, it's, sometimes music is, needs to wait. Mm. You might write a song today that you kind of know in your heart is not going to be something you're going to probably record for the couple of years, but you know down the line, mm -hmm. I knew when I was 17 years old that Annabelle Lee someday would be a song. And it's a great song, and it is a great song on stage because, you know, you never know when you play new songs how they're going to go over on stage because you never know when there's going to be a person out there that's going to go, okay, exactly, which one of my favorite songs did you take out to put in that new song? So you always are, you're treading on eggshells when you add new, new songs to your set. Mm. So usually in, in the past for Fleetwood Mac and for me, it's like when we did Rumors, we we kind of chucked Fleetwood Mac, Fleetwood Mac, and just went on stage and did the entire Rumors album, and almost got booed off the stage, and went straight into the, to a studio the next day, and redid our set, and put back in 99% of the set that we had done after Fleetwood Mac, Fleetwood Mac, mm -hmm. which is 75, and then put like two songs from Rumors. Because mm -hmm. you can't, you can't, uh, you can't overwhelm people. Yeah. You have to be really careful with your new stuff. You have to really sequence it right. really kind of kind of secretly in so they're not like, you know, like what is that? Right. So that's what we did, but we ended up being able to do six new songs in the set. And uh that's outrageous because in Tr Trouble in Shangri-La in 2001, I started out with five or six songs. By the last concert, not one song from Trouble in Shangri-La was left in the set. And that's a little bit heartbreaking, but not when you're doing a song that's not really going over. Right. So yeah. you're like, that's out. Um, so these demos of yours, there's more material. Oh, um, so much more. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, good. It's, 
uh, I think in a recent interview you were you you, were, you talked about how um, like even your manager and and some other people were being really negative, Nancy, about the music industry. About like you don't want to do an album, Stevie. It's not you know the music industry C sucks now. And how that was 2005. That was 2005. Yeah, when I came off the road from uh, the Say You Will Fleetwood Mac tour, which was 135 shows. Wow. But I was, that's what I always do. I tour with Fleetwood Mac, and then I go and do a record by myself, and I tour with that. And I don't tour quite, I don't tour as extensively as Fleetwood Mac does, mm -hmm. but I tour, and then I go back to Fleetwood Mac, and then I go back to me, and then I go back. So that's ever since 1982 when Belladonna came out. That or eighty one, whatever. Um, that's what that's what I've done. So when I came off the road, I had done a record in two thousand, put out a record in two thousand one. So in two thousand five, when the Fleetwood Mac thing was all done, then I was like, okay, well I'm going to go and do what I always do. I'm going to do a record. And management, everybody was like, I know this is going to really totally hurt your feelings, but don't bother. Internet piracy is taking everything away. It is ruining your publishing. It is, it's like people walking in your house and stealing your, just saying like, you know what, I love that picture of the gypsy over your <laughs> fireplace. Yep. I'm just going to take it. I'm just going to load it into my car because we should just share everything. And, <laughs> and you're like standing there like, okay, I guess so. That's what my songs are, you know, right. and it's like, how dare you? So the thing is, is that I didn't fight back with that. I just said, because basically they said to me, you know, you're a, a big touring act, Fleetwood Mac and you. You can do big venues, you can sell out lots of tickets, you can still make lots of money. All of these new acts that are out there, you know, trying their hardest, they don't have a repertoire. They don't have three hours of music that they can do. They can't do big shows. They can't play the Staples, they can't play Jones Beach. So that's what you should do until somebody gets a handle on this internet piracy thing. Mm. So that's what I did. I just kind I toured Was all the way till 2009 when I wrote Moon Knight, A Vampire's Dream, and said, it was at the very end of the Fleetwood Mac tour, and I, I finished it in Australia, and I said to my assistant, we recorded it on camera, and she said, here's a camera, and she went and hid down the hall, like she wasn't listening, but she was. And, but I was there by myself, and I played the song, and I got up and I said, okay, you can come out now, Karen. Um, I'm ready to make a record now. So. Did, in retrospect, did that seem like a really creatively stultifying time? Like, were you like, no one wants to, you know, I'm going to be, everything's going to be stolen, and so your brain wasn't able to write songs, and no. then you had to sort of trick yourself into doing it, or no. how did it come out? No, how did because it... I would write if I was if I was an accountant. Right. I wouldn't care. Yeah. Um, you know, I went to school for, I went to college for five years. I would have been a speech therapist or a public speaker or a, a teacher or something. So I. If I had not made it in this business, my mom made sure that I had a really brilliant education mm -hmm. so that I, as she said, I know you're going to be famous, honey, and I believe that, and your daddy does too. But what we don't want for you is, because we saw it with your dad's father, with your granddad, we don't want you to get out there in this big world, and both you and Lindsay, we don't want you to get out there, and just in case this doesn't work, and we're not saying it's not going to work because we think you're great. Mm -hmm. And they did. They were so supportive. They completely supported me for five solid years going to college and being in a band with Lindsay. Um, but they said in case, you know, my mom especially, she said, you know, we want you, if you do become very famous, we want you to be able to stand in a room with world politicians mm -hmm. and famous writers and famous, you know, economists, and we want you to be able to hold your own. We want you to be smart and beautiful and talented, and we want you to have an education. So we will support you until you stop. But when you stop, when you quit school, we will withdraw all financial support. And they did. Mm -hmm. Because I stopped six months before I graduated from San Jose State. Mm -hmm. And because Lindsay and I made the decision that we had to go to L.A. and we had to go now. And I said, I called him and I said, I'm, we're, we're going, Mom. We have to. And she said, okay, honey, but you know what that means. I said, I know. And uh, so we went to Los Angeles and I got, you know, three waitress jobs. And I cleaned my, my producer's house twice a week, even though I lived there. Um, and I cooked. And I kept everything beautiful, and I did that for five years. And I pretty much supported me and Lindsay and Richard Dashett. 
um, who was one of our, our friend and ended up being one of the producers on Rumors. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was okay because I, A, I had a great education. I didn't have to be a waitress, but I chose to do that because I could pick my own hours mm -hmm. and I could clean Keith's house at night, so it didn't really matter. Um, and I, you know, I did, I did what I had to do to make that work. And it did work. It took from, we moved to L.A. Um, at the beginning of 71. And the first day of 1975, we joined Fleetwood Mac. And, and Buckingham Knicks came out in 73. Right. And the record company dropped it about three months after it came out. And we were floored because we thought, how can we make a better record than that? We're, we're like, we're so, we were so puzzled by that, you know. And so we started making a spec album, which is a record that, that the producer was just going to pay for, hmm. and then we were going to get we'd get a record another record deal when we were done, and um, and it was starting to be a great record because we started like in about seventy four and a half, and um, and and when we joined Fleetwood Mac, you know Lindsay really didn't want to join Fleetwood Mac because hmm. he was really happy with what we were doing as it was, and we both believed in our heart that we would have made it through Buckingham Knicks, and Buckingham Knicks was simmering around the United States at that point anyway. We, uh, Fleetwood Mac allowed us, because we got an offer in Birmingham, Alabama, to go and do a show. For 5,000 people, it's crazy. I'm a cleaning lady, crazy, 5,000 people. <laughs> and, um, and they allowed us to go. And we went and did it, and you know, Lindsay's like, this record's happening, it's, it's taken two years, but this record is climbing up. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, it is, but we are dirt poor. <laughs> and I don't want to be a waitress anymore, Lindsay. So if we don't do well in Fleetwood Mac, then we'll quit. But at least we can save a little money, and at least we can fix reverse in our car, you know? Because we can't go anywhere without reverse. <laughs> that is very, like, philosophical. We always, like have to, we always have to find a parking place where you can go out front ways. <laughs> or we're stuck there all night. <laughs> You, um, in, in, there's a moment in the film when, uh, when Lindsay comes to accompany you for Orleans, I think, the New Orleans song? Am Soldier's right? Angel. S sorry, Soldier's Angel. Um, and, uh, and you mentioned how it sort of kind of put to rest a war between you. And I was surprised that it's been this long simmering. Uh, you the know. war? Yeah. Because you don't seem like a bitter, unforgiving person. You seem like you are pretty centered. I, I'm surprised that that still happens. I guess, I mean, I mean, I have that with people too, but... Well, it, <laughs> oh, you know, first of all, he, <laughs> he, he came in for two or three days, and he really, he really enjoyed being with Dave and I, mm. because it was like a big cashmere hug. And he's not used to that. Everybody was lovely to him, and, and you know, everybody was thrilled with what he was doing on Soldier's Angel, and, and Dave was filming him from every angle. From Dave was hanging upside down from the top of the stairs with a, fi with a flip camera, and, you know, he had cameras everywhere, and, and Lindsay felt apart, you know, and he could not deny how beautiful our situation was and how much fun we were having, and this was a very serious song that we were doing. Mm. And, and we called him because we, I said to Dave, I don't think we can do this song without Lindsay. I think that he's the only person that can pull my demo of this song off because it's so serious and it's very, very old time, Stevie and Lindsay. And, I, and we did try to record it and, it, and we recorded it great, but it came out very um, more eerie mm -hmm. and creepy kind of, you know, and it didn't, but it wasn't brutal. And I say that in the film, it's not brutal. And how do you, you know, if you, we couldn't figure out how to go from my piano demo to a real recording of it. Mm -hmm. And we were even gonna, we were to the point where I was gonna just use the demo. But I had, st I was writing it when I did the demo, so I was stopping and starting and they tried to fix that and it was jumping and, so I finally just said, Dave, I think we're gonna have to call Lindsay. And of course Dave's like, let's call him now. And he came up and you know, within two days we had recorded the song. And it came out amazing. And I think he and I both realized that it, it gave us both a moment of clarity that we could be in a studio together or in a house together and 
be working on a song and not be so Lindsay and Stevie, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, when you have a love affair like Lindsay and I had, it, it, it it's, it's never goes away. And it's never, nobody ever, in, in our case anyway, nobody ever really got over it. And and so the war that goes on between Lindsay and I is the is like the war of the worlds. It's it's the war of why aren't we still together? For Lindsay, it's the war of of if we hadn't joined Fleetwood Mac, you and I would have gotten married and moved back to San Francisco and had children and still did our movie. I mean, our our, our career, mm. our movie would have been a movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he feels that way to this day. So. He's never he's never been able to quite let that go. He's a serious guy. He's a very very serious guy. I was like, smile, Lindsay. Yeah. I just want to give him a hug. And, and you he know. and 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 you know we got him to smile. We yeah. got him to laugh. And and I mean obviously I I I didn't go out with that guy because he was like a jerk. I went out with him because he was gorgeous and he had a beautiful smile and a wonderful laugh and he was a lot of fun in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then like men and women do, they get they get people get possessive and 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 con consuming and and uh, all powerful and uh, wanting to run the show completely. And of course, you saw it in the film. Yeah. For right. me, it's like I'm gonna let I'm gonna either you let me drive with you or I'm not gonna do it. Oh, when he gives you the little songwriting tip, when he's like, you can't go from first to yeah. second person. Well, see, yeah. I mean, and see, if he could just learn that, if he yeah. could learn not to tell, he should know better right. by now than to say, I think you should change the tense of that verse. Yeah. Because it's like, I'm just going to turn right around and say, what I did say is, really, would you say that to Bob Dylan? Yeah. I think that, you know, on It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only Dying, you should, like, say, It's All Right, Ma, You're Only Dying. Because Bob Dylan would really say to you, it's none of your business. <laughs> what I say. Right. This is my thing. What I say, you can produce, you can, you can add a few chords here and there, you can, but you cannot change the heart and soul of my song. And uh, so that was a, you know, when he said it's a rule of thumb, that was a bad thing to say. No, not good. Because because I don't have rules, mm. I, and that's why I never took any music. That's what lesson. I love. Also, uh, did they did they show that clip where you're saying yeah, where they where you're like I, I'm just letting it flow, and right. you go you go you go through time, different time increments, yeah. and and you don't see. Since I never took piano lessons, I don't know if something that I'm doing is wrong. Uh -huh. And every time I would say over the last 35 years. I think I'm going to take piano lessons. Everybody would say, oh, no, 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 don't do that, because if you do, then you'll have rules. And um, the way you write is so not rule-esque that if you start to have rules, you'll start writing songs like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I took one month of guitar lessons, classical guitar lessons, one month, four weeks. And I learned enough, you know, to manage to write Goldust Woman and Landslide, Lady from the Mountains. And, you know, I, I, I got a lot, I got what I needed in that one month. So I, you know, I, I kind of tell pe people, you know, the little writers that are coming along that ask me, I said, you don't, you don't really have to take tons and tons of music lessons. Just get enough. Mm -hmm. Just get 10 chords. You know, and I never took a piano lesson, so I mean, I don't even think you have to take piano lessons. I think you could just go, <laughs> just go sit at the piano and play around with it, and you'll, some, when you find something that sounds good, record it. Right. Yeah. And you're, you're done. You know, you don't really have to be a, a genius. Yeah. Um, here's another thing about you. You don't seem mean or like a mean girl or like competitive at all with other women. And I've always loved how unifying, you, how woman friendly, I don't know if that's a gross way to say it, but like your music isn't, you know, like, shut up. It's right. like, um, right. and, and Laurie and Sharon have been with you forever. And right. it just, you just seem like a, you're not competitive in that way with, with, with women. No. Um, and I've always wondered, like back in the day, um, you, your, your contemporaries, say Linda Ronstadt or uh, Anne Nancy or something like that, right. uh, what was the feeling back then with, with all you women kind of coming up in well, the scene? Well, first of all, before Fleetwood Mac, there were no girls. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the Linda Ronstadt's and the, 
and the hearts and all the, they they weren't around. So I mean they were around but they weren't in our life. So it was all boys. Mm -hmm. I was really the only girl. And um but when I joined Fleetwood Mac, I had Christine. And the whole reason that we were able to join uh, to join Fleetwood Mac was because um, Fleetwood Mac, the boys had said to her, John and Mick and, and, and uh, well, John and Mick, really. Hmm. I can't think of another one because <laughs> Lindsay wasn't there yet. Um, John and Mick and Christine came to Los Angeles. Yeah. And they said to Chris, we found the guy, but sh he comes as a package. He comes with a girlfriend, and we're not getting him without her. And she's a really good singer, and she writes songs, and but we, we know, we realize we already have a girl singer, so do we really, so it's up to you, Chris. We'll have dinner with them, and if you like her, then we'll ask them to join the band. If you don't like her, then we won't ask them to join the band. A little bit and of pressure so, there. <laughs> on her. Yeah. So we, we <laughs> went to dinner, and uh, we had a ball, and I just adored Christine. Um, Chris was five years older than me, but we were only, we were like, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. My math is so good. And she was... <laughs> it is good, actually. She was 32, so she yeah. was really young, too, you know? And I was, like, 28. So all of a sudden, I had this great woman in my life. I had a best friend in my band. And Chris and I made a pact from the very beginning that, you know, she knew all the famous people. She, Stevie Winwood used to carry her books to school. She hung out with... Eric Clapton and all of those, and Jimmy Page and and all the she, I mean she knew all of them well, and we said to each other we will never be treated like second class citizens. If we're sitting in a room with all those famous guys, we will be as famous as them, and we will they will respect us or we will walk out. Hmm. And so we kind of went in with such an attitude, the two of us, that we were a force to be reckoned with. Nice. Nice. Um, uh, backstage you were saying how you have um, her piano now because she has retired officially. Right. Yeah. Can you give me any theory about why she retired and will, it, will she ever come back? And I, She's such an incredible songwriter. I, I, I think, that, you know what, uh, I... Chris started to get panic attacks in the last couple of years where she didn't want to fly. Mm. And you, when you tour like Fleetwood Mac tours, you can't, you, we, the band can't go on a bus because we'd, we, we'd be too tired to go on stage. So she got really afraid of flying. Mm. And, um, and she'd been doing this since she was 14. I mean, I started, you know, in my 20s. So since she was 14, she'd been in a band. And uh, after the dance, we went to the Grammys, and um, and and it wasn't we didn't win the Grammy, which we wanted to win really a lot for for the dance, mm -hmm. and Lindsay got kind of mad, and um, uh, she wasn't really happy with that situation, and basically when it was all over and everybody had gone home and she and I were uh, doing some press, mm -hmm. she said to me, "I, I quit," mm -hmm. and I'm. Uh, and, I'm, and, and I looked at her like, really? Because we had done 40 shows. We hadn't left the United States. We could have done, you know, two months in Australia, a couple months in Europe. We could have toured the whole world. We could have been out for another year, hmm. and, which would have been multi-million dollars. And so I said, really? <laughs> and she said, really? And the look in her eyes was like when somebody breaks up with you and you know they're not kidding. <laughs> yeah. And you know that there's no reason for you to go. But so I said, so now you're done? And she said, I'm done. And I said, okay, well, are, are, who's telling them, me or you? And she said, no, I'll tell them. So the band basically broke up for until the, until the uh, announcement. Right. Until we went back yep. together to do uh, Say You Will. Right. We, we really had to think for several many years whether or not we were going to continue without her. Mm -hmm. Or with, if we could. Mm -hmm. And I think the only reason that we could continue without her was because the stage itself still looked very similar. 
because you had Crazy Mick in the middle and Lindsay here and me here and John here. And the only thing that was missing was Chris, who never wanted to be in the spotlight anyway. Mm -hmm. So she was way over on the side <laughs> behind her big, huge Hammond organ. Right. And that's how she wanted it. She wanted, Chris always wanted to be one of the musicians. She mm -hmm. never had any want to walk out there and, and, and be in center stage. Mm -hmm. So because of that, we could pretty much replicate the show without her. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to, to continue. Mm -hmm. um, I have to ask you, or else my friends will kill me, um, about Night of Thousand Stevies. Do you know that? Yeah. Uh, I want to know, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a night in New York where everyone worships Miss Nix, basically. Um, People it's dress a reason up. for a costume party. <laughs> <laughs> so when you first heard about it, what, was, what, what did you think? Well, it was a long time ago. Yeah, 20 years, I think, it's been going on. I was very, I, of course I was like super surprised, but you know, I'm like the Halloween girl from hell, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I accepted a Halloween gig this year because, why? Because I love Halloween. Because I should be done. I mean, my last show is like a Elton John benefit, right, that's right. coming up. And I'm done. And I um, got an offer to play a, a, a big Halloween thing in San Francisco. Hmm. I'm like, I'm, I'm so in. I'm there. And, uh, and I'm going in costume, and so are the girls. And it, it's, you know, so I am that person. And so when I found out about it, I was, I was at first I was like, I was thrilled that my little idea of costuming myself since 1975 had worked so well and that people really did like all my, my choices of mm -hmm. clothes that I wear on stage and that, you know, if I get a white dress, that everybody gets a white dress and if I go back to black, everybody goes back to black. <laughs> and if I, if I wear these boots, everybody, right. instead of the ones that come to here, everybody go, goes to that. <laughs> so it's like, I, I, I love that. I, I feel like, you know, I got to not only be a singer, but I got to be a, a trendsetter. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it, it continued, in the beginning, it was just like a great, fun thing that I thought would happen once, you know. Mm -hmm. The fact that it has continued until now, I'm just, uh, I'm thrilled. Because I love the fact that people love my music enough to gather and dress up like me, you know, because, because I do that. And, you know, one of these days, I dress up like me. One of these days, I'm going to dress up like me. And go. And go. Please do. I think you should. And, and, and nobody's going to know it's me, though. And then I'm going to just saunter up there to the stage and take off my fantastic mask that I'll be wearing and just break into Edge of 17. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And people will be like, is that her? <laughs> no, no, it's it. <laughs> or is that just somebody who really sings good and sings like her and looks a lot like her? <laughs> and then they'll be like, no, I think it's her. Hilarious. So I'm, you know, I'm thrilled. I mean, I am, I'm, I'm honored and I'm thrilled and, and I'm glad that it brings people happiness, you know, because it's all, my clothes and what I do brings me lots of happiness. So I, I love it that, it that it has rubbed off. It's, it is like a spring ritual. Every time I've gone, it's always been like, it's, it's about ringing in the spring to me. Right. That's what it's like. Um, hey, you. how are we doing on time? Are we, sh question and answer now? Yay, Q&A time. I can't even see the eye. I know. I know um, you're there, but you're kind of black. You're kind of in black. I don't know. Ah! Uh, I don't know how this. Oh, well, there, I don't think we have to select it. They'll just do it for us. Okay. So we'll just sit here and wait. Oh, here we Stevie, go. Stevie, my question is: When did you have that moment where you knew you're a rock and roll star? Like Oprah famously says that she used her money and went out and bought new towels. What was your <laughs> "Hey, I'm a rock star now" moment back in the '70s? When I joined Fleetwood Mac, I immediately moved out of the apartment that I lived in with Lindsay and Richard. Immediately. I went and found an apartment on Hollywood Boulevard. And um, the second thing I did was I bought a 280 SL Mercedes. Mm -hmm. okay. Hard top convertible, red interior. I did drive, though. I drove until 1978, and my, the only reason I don't drive was because my, my, uh, my license ran out. 
and I just was too lazy to go get a new license. <laughs> and then, you know, it sort of became like, when you get really famous really fast, it's like, what am I going to do? Like, go to a bar by myself? <laughs> or or go, to, go to the market by myself, you know? I, I, it, it's, that's how it became, because Fleetwood Mac got so big so fast that all the things that I had been doing, you know, since I moved to L.A., which was really being the caretaker of a lot of people, went out the window. Somebody once said to me, just so you know, the one time I ever went to a psychologist, whom I liked very much, but that's way too much work for me. So I, and she said to me, after I told her about what I did when I was the cleaning lady and I made dinner and I cleaned the house and all that, that I loved and I took on that role lovingly, she said, I, I think that you sound like you're really a caretaker. And I said, I am. When people come to my house, I'm the one that makes sure that the bed is beautifully made and that there's like the beautiful, you know, all, everything, the sheets, everything. It's perfect. I do that. Nobody does that for me. And I love that. So if somebody comes and they don't feel well, I make them a llama hot water bottle and give them the cashmere blanket and make sure that they, that they, they know how to work the TV. It's like, so <laughs> I'm, a, I'm that ca caretaker. And she said, I think that the day you joined Fleetwood Mac was the saddest day of, day of your life in many ways because a lot of the things that you love to do, which is to take care of people, ended on that day and people started to take care of you. Hmm. Wow. Hi, Stevie. Um, you did a lot of press for the In Your Dreams CD. Uh, will you and Dave be doing press with this DVD and maybe a signing or something? Whatever we can do, yes. Absolutely. I'm, I, I, my last gig was really two days ago, and I have, two, I have Halloween and Elton John left, and then for the next several many months, um, I don't start up with Fleetwood Mac until next fe uh, March. So um, I'm, yeah, we're absolutely going to do everything we can do to get this film out to the masses. Um. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hi, Stevie. Um, I wanted to know, I'm right here. Right there. Hi. Where is she? I'm right here. Okay. Hey. <laughs> um, I wanted to know, um, always, have you ever considered doing an R&B album, like straight R&B? And if you do, who would you like to collaborate with? <laughs> I, you know what? I, I learned to sing with R&B music, even though I had a country singing grandfather. So my parents used to really say when I was like the fourth grade, like, who are you? You're sitting in the back seat singing along with, you know, with, with all the R&B girl groups that were out when I was in the fourth fifth, sixth, seventh grade. And um, I said, well, because I, I, I really don't, I'm really not going country. I'm really going R&B. And so um, I've all, it's always been a dream of me to do, to do something like that. And I just did a, a, a thing with, uh, with Babyface. And, um, and he, um, he, he even said he would like to write with me. That would be amazing. <laughs> That would be amazing. And he is cute. <laughs> Hi, Stevie. My name is Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Nice to meet you. Um, I have a question for you. When it comes to, uh, say, In Your Dreams or Trouble in Shangri-La, how many songs are you writing for these records? And where do you get to the point when you say, OK, this song isn't working. I'm going to stop working on it. Or I'm going to focus on this thing. I know this song is going to make it to the record. How many songs do you think total that you wrote for each of those? And where was the point where you said, this isn't working? Um, if my songs make it onto that cassette, they're working for me. When you go into the studio, sometimes they, they just, they don't work. But then they go back into the vault, because that doesn't mean that they're not going to work three years from now. So I, I don't ever, I never even give anybody anything unless I feel like it's really good and really finished in as much as far as I can go with it. So I, I never, I, I never even play parts of songs for people. You know, it's like they're they're done. Now, of course, writing with Dave is a different thing because I'm writing with another person. Um, so you know, when I mean, there were a couple things that we did that neither of us liked, and so we just dropped them, you know, and moved on. Just parts. 
usually just parts. You, you pretty much know really fast. You get one really good verse and you're like, this is great, you know, so now we're going to try to make a chorus that's as good as that verse. Um, so it's, it, it's that's, not, that's not the hard part. The hard part is too many good songs and mm -hmm. then having to take some of those songs off. And putting them in the vault. And putting them in the vault to wait for them to be, you know, re reborn again. Hi, Stevie. I'm Kevin. Nice to meet you. Hi, Kevin. Those of us that have been following you, like, for a very long time, we often say to one another, the voice. Is the voice just so touching and just hits us in our hearts? And we always thought, would Stevie ever consider doing an acoustic tour with just a piano, just a guitar? Um, you know, the kind of tour that I would love to do someday is I'd like to... There's so many of my songs on all my different albums that I would love to, you know, you, you can't do them all. I mean, you'd, you'd, have, a, you'd have a 10 hour set, so you can't, <laughs> I know, and, and that would be great, but you'd, you can't do it. You'd have to spread it over a week. So, so, what you, so what I'm thinking is you could do a thing where you, where you really arranged, and I really don't like the word medley, but, but you could do a thing where you really do bits and pieces of, you know, of going all the way back so that you start with, you know, you can ride high atop your pony, I know it won't, because the whole thing's phony, Belladonna coming out of the darkness. So you could do a minute and a half, two minutes of Belladonna, and then you could switch into, um, there is a reason, don't blame it on me, blame it on my wild heart. And straight into, Sometimes it rages, it rocks a little, even when it's calm, it rocks a little. So that's, I would, I would be so pleased to do that because there's so many songs that I have written that I would love to do. But you, you know, you can, a two hour and ten minute set, you know, you, is a long set. It's a long set when you're 30 and it's a long set when you're 64. <laughs> You can do it. But someday, one of these days, I will do it. And I'll have, you know, I'll have Wadi and I'll have the girls. And I'll have bass. I'll have drums. And I'll have them in the back. And sometimes they'll come forward. And, you know, it's like something. It would be a whole nother kind of way to look at my music. And for me, it would be great. Because sometimes I think about some of those beautiful songs that, that nobody will ever hear me do. Because they'll never make it onto the stage. So, you know, that's all, you know, when I don't, when I don't want to do 135 shows, it's like, then that's what I'll do. I'll start doing things that are more eclectic. So, you know, the world, it's, what's to come is, for me, always exciting. And a new album, maybe, with that. Hi, Stevie. I'm Bill. Nice Hi, to meet Bill. you. Um, you've appeared in kind of a spate of recent memoirs. Anna and Nancy Wilson mentioned you in their new book, and there's... I just heard about that. Yep, and there's Making Rumors, Ken Calais, with all your journals and I, spate of fans who would be so excited. Are you planning on ever penning a tell-all or a really great autobiography? Because I think there's big I, demand I, you for know it. What? I'm not ever going to write that kind of book. <laughs> if I ever write a book, it'll be... Uh, it'll be vignettes. It'll be, you know, it'll be the day I joined Fleetwood Mac. It'll be the day I met Lindsay. It'll be the day I decided to do a record with Dave, St with Dave Stewart. It'll be, it'll be all, it'll be the magical moments. I am never going to write a book to drag people through the dredges of my life because I don't think people need to know that. I think that everybody has heard me do enough interviews, you know, on drugs that they all, everybody knows that, was a, that there was some very bad times in my life. But you know what? I survived. And, and I'm okay. And, and, I, I, and I try to tell people about whenever anybody says, you want to talk about Klonopin, I'm like, sit down. Let's talk about Klonopin. You want to talk about cocaine? Sit down. Let's talk about cocaine. Let's talk about Let's talk about, 
you know, watch the video of I Can't Wait and watch and look at my swimming eyes and think, think you know, could you just light up the booze, the coke, the cigarettes, the pot for the just two days day and then while you made a million dollar video? Okay. It's like, you know, yeah, I'd love to talk about it with you, but I'm not going to write about it in a book because everybody already knows. So what I would write about are the things that knocked me out as I went through my life. And that, you know, the men that just knocked me out, the, the music that knocked me out, the, you, know, the, the, my, you know, my friends that just continue to knock me out every day, today and 50 years ago. Um, how it all started in each little genre of my life, how that all started the really beautiful romantic things. That is the stuff that I would love to tell y'all. I don't really, I don't really, um, I, I'm not gonna, I'm, I, and certainly I'm not gonna go and talk about, you know, I went on the road with Anne and Nancy for a, a week and we just had a ball. We did a lot of drugs and, uh, and we had a great time. You. And you know what, they, I think they wrote about it and I wish they hadn't. Because I thought that that was private. And, and I, I happen to have an amazing respect for Ann Wilson. I think she's one of the best singers in the world. I think she's right there behind Robert Plant. I think that Nancy Wilson is, and I've told her, right there behind Lindsey Buckingham and Waddy Wachtel and, those ama and Dave Stewart, those amazing guitar players. I love these girls. I would have I preferred that they had left me out of the book. Because we're not, you know, we weren't best friends our whole life. We didn't, you know, we spent a little time together and we influenced each other. But I would have preferred they had left me out of their book. So if I was going, they will not be a vignette in my book. <laughs> okay, this is the, uh, the last question right over here. Oh, okay. okay. Where are we right over here? Okay. Hi, I'm Allie. Hi, Dave. Okay. Hi, Allie. Now that we all, I'm Allie. Okay. Um, I read in an interview that after you tour with Fleetwood Mac, you're going on a rest or a break. After your break, are you going to go on tour again, or are you going to do not another tour? I mean, this is not a tour tour, like just small shows, like casinos and stuff. Um, <laughs> you mean after I come off this one, and then next like March go on the Fleetwood yeah, Mac like tour, after you're which done will with be Mac. probably a year. Mm-hmm. I have to plan in advance. Right, I do, <laughs> and and I do too. Um, you know what? I'll I, I'll be all through Fleetwood Mac. I'll be writing. Okay. Because I that's a great place to write. Yeah. Cause so I keep a journal. I write every night. You know. So I'll be writing poetry, and I'm you know I'm in the middle of my Game of Thrones poetry right now. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, you know so I'll be writing, and so when I come off the road with Fleetwood Mac. I w I'll do what I always do. I'll go to Hawaii for two months, or I'll go somewhere really nice for two months, and I'll hang out, and then I'll, you know, and then I'll, I'll go back on the road with my own thing, mm -hmm. or, or I'll run and find Dave Stewart and do another record. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, okay, I guess that's it. Oh. You're You've had a beautiful. lot of trouble with that mic I know. all <laughs> the way through this show. It's just a curse of mine. Um, you're the most beautiful original person ever. Thank you so much for spending time with us. <laughs>